Hey everybody, welcome to our Data Umbrella webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction, about five minutes, and then Laura is going to do her presentation. And um, you can ask questions in the Q&A and we will answer them as the um, presentation goes on. This is being recorded and will be available usually within 24 hours on our YouTube. Data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, I'm a statistician by training, and you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub at Reshma S. We have a code of conduct. We're dedicated to providing harassment experience for everyone. Please be mindful of what you put in the chat. Thank you. Uh, there are various ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct, to contribute to making it a welcoming and collaborative space. We have a Discord community where you can ask and answer general questions or share events or job postings. We, um, you can donate to our nonprofit via Open Collective, or if you work for a company that uses Benevity, um, your company will match any donations you make, and that's another way to contribute to data and data. We have a lot of uh, video libraries on YouTube. One of them is contributing to open source. Um, another is career advice. Um, and some of the samplings that we have is data visualization and contributing um, data science for beginners, the scikit-learn sprint, and we have a series for PyMC library and the NumPy library. And this is just a sampling of some of the events that we've done. On our website, we have a lot of resources uh, related to using inclusive language, allyship, accessibility, responsibility, a lot of other things. We encourage you to check them out. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The ones that are highlighted here, Meetup is the place to go to find out about upcoming events. YouTube is where all of our recordings are placed. We also have a blog and we have a newsletter which you can subscribe to on Substack and we have a once a month newsletter. And we're also active on Twitter and LinkedIn. This webinar uses a platform called Big Marker and we do offer live captioning. So if you go to the very top of your screen, there are two letters CC for closed captioning. If you click on that, you can see the English captioning um, appear as this webinar is ongoing. There is a slight um, delay in, in the transcript, but it is available. Uh, for March, we're doing a special series of events. Uh, this is the second in the series event, which is uh, creating a plot, Python Plotly dashboard. Last week, well, on, on March 1st, we had geospatial data and maps with Python. That recording is available. Um, on the 15th, which is this coming Tuesday, we're having a presentation on arrays, linked lists, and graphs with Claire Sullivan from Neo4j. On the 22nd, um, Lauren Burke will be presenting on setting up a Jekyll blog using GitHub pages. And this is a free way to set up a blog, and it's a great way to get started. Um, and then our series will conclude at the end of the month, Intro to Hall of Is, which is another um, it's another platform. I'm not sure if the word platform is correct, but it's a way to um, show dashboards and visualizations. And um, you can sign up for any of these and all of these events on Meetup. Today's talk is Laura gutierrez Winterberg, who is joining us from Vancouver, Canada, and is creating a Python Plotly dashboard. Laura works as a data scientist in the maritime industry. She holds a bachelor's of mathematics from Simon Fraser University. Her alma mater recognized her work in creating enriching learning experiences by awarding her the Terry Fox Gold Medal. You can find Laura on LinkedIn as Laura Funderburg, and you can find her on Twitter as LG Funderburg as well. Uh, feel free to tweet about this event. We are at Data Umbrella on Twitter. It's always nice to see people sharing um, their experience. And with that, I am going to turn over the camera and mic to Laura. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will get them answered um, as we can. Thank you so much for that introduction, Reshima. And welcome everyone to today's session. So as the title of the talk goes, so today I'll be talking about how to build your own Plotly dashboard. So the workshop is built um, assuming some comfort with the Pandas Python library. 
and but it doesn't assume a lot of exposure to the Plotly Python package. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by sharing a few examples of what exploratory data visualization with Plotly looks like, and then how we can go from exploratory code onto a reusable Python script. And then from there, the last piece is going to be to talk about how we can improve or incre increment the complexity of our script so that we can turn it into a, pl a Plotly Dash app. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So Reshima has shared on the chat the link to the GitHub repository. Uh, so this will be recorded. So uh, for the duration of the webinar, uh, feel free to just enjoy and watch. If you'd like to follow along, this will be made available later on if you'd like to revisit some of the steps that I'm following. So I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen. Um, and probably what makes sense before I dive into the actual content of the notebook of the presentation is to tell you a little bit about what's inside this GitHub repository. Um, so all of the material that I'll be sharing lives in um, this uh, notebooks. Um, let me just make sure that I have the right one. This one does not look like the right link. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just go. Okay. So in here, you'll see that there is uh, a notebooks folder. And inside this folder, there's a couple notebooks. One is part one data exploration, and then part two is dashboards components. And then in this folder, you're going to see there's a couple scripts. So there's app.py. This is going to contain our app. If we're going to we're gonna do one step at a time in terms of how we can build an app ourselves. And then basecript.py is going to be sort of the, the, first, um, the first step going from exploratory code onto a script. Other files that are going to be key players inside this are the requirements.txt. Uh, this file contains essentially a list of all the, yeah, go ahead. Just maximize, you know, this, this union, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so this requirements.txt file contains a list of all the different dependencies that the scripts depend on. And you notice that these are all versioned. Uh, this is typically a, a step that I always like to incorporate in development. Because, as you may know, many of these dependencies or libraries will be updated and upgraded as time goes by. And some of the functionality that was functional or available in one version won't be necessarily in the next. So uh, to capture and have a consistent environment, it's always a good idea to have a requirements.txt file for exploring and for developing. Um, OK, so let me go ahead and jump in. So the first thing I'm going to do is I start an environment. And I won't get too, too much in the weeds on that. Uh, but assuming I go ahead and start an environment, I go ahead and open up uh, this part one data exploration. I'm going to be using the Jupyter Notebooks platform. I'm going to go ahead and get started with that. All right. So. Uh, some of the things that I assume for this webinar, uh, one, I do have some assumption for at least exposure and comfort with practices for data cleaning and exploration through uh, the Pandas library. A little bit of visualization is assumed. Uh, if you have had experience working with Matplotlib or Seaborn or any other uh, visualiz visualization library outside of Python, that's also great. And then uh, I will be navigating this through the Jupyter environment, so so no worries on that end. And so the main the main two components of this workshop is one we're going to be focusing on data exploration, and then from there I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about how we can explore the main components in a Dash uh, app. So let's get started with the data exploration piece. Uh, so the first couple of things I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to start off by importing uh, the Pandas library. And uh, from Plotly, I'm going to, sorry, from Plotly, I'm going to go ahead and take the express module through the alias PX. And then what I have here is I have... Oh, sorry, uh, yep. to again. Can you make the font larger, please? Uh, yes. That, that's better. Thank you. No worries. All right, so from here, I'm going to go ahead and read data. So what I've done is I have saved here uh, the content of a CSV in this really long URL. 
But if I go ahead and visit this URL, and this is going to be quite small. I don't expect you to, to parse all of this, but just to show you what we're going to be grabbing. So this is the data. It's going to contain column geography, time, delinquency rate, average mortgage amount, and population size. So it's a tabular format separated by commas. And then there's a few entries from there. So that is the content of the data. So all I'm doing from here is I'm reading that data through the pandas module read CSV. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the first few rows through the head method. All right. So here is the data in a data frame format. Uh, if I want to go ahead and take a look at a little bit more in depth of what the, the data contains, I can go ahead and ask a few questions. OK, so one, what are some of the relevant variables in the data? We can talk about uh, the range, mean, median of some of our numerical columns, delinquency rate, average mortgage amount, and population size. And what is the time range and frequency of the data? So a little bit of background about this data. Uh, this data was obtained through uh, co combining tables from the StatsCan uh, website, Statistics Canada. So Statistics Canada is a, a government agency uh, that is that is in charge of providing open data on on various key indicators. Uh, from this country. Uh, this is where I'm currently based. And so the particular data set that, I'm, that I'm, I'll be uh, sharing with you today is a curated data set obtained from several tables from Statistics Canada. And the key data that I'm going to be exploring in today's webinar is uh, trends in the housing market. So some of the things that I'm going to be looking at are delinquency rate for the past few years broken down by quarters. Uh, the average mortgage amount, and then population size for different provinces. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance or haven't uh, been exposed to Canada before, so Canada is located in North America. And let me just go ahead and open up a map. And within Canada, we are broken down by provinces. So each of these regions here is a province. I am based in British Columbia. Uh, the main provinces are British Columbia or BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Sorry, uh, in Quebec, we have Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Labrador, uh, and Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Anabut. So, so these are some, just to provide a little bit of context in, some, in terms of the terminology that the data set contains. Okay, so from here, uh, some of the things that I typically like to do to get familiar with the data include using the dot .info method applied onto uh, the, the data frame itself, just as a quick refresher. This variable here, data pop del morph df, contains the, the full table that I prepared for this, uh, this webinar. That head, as we saw before, is going to show us the first five rows of the data frame. That tail will show us the first, the last five rows. And then, of course, uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to go through each and every one of these um, manually. So some of the methods that we can use to make life a little easier include the info method, which is going to tell us the number of entries in the data frame. In this case, it has a total of 330 rows, numbered from 0 to 329. And then in here, I can see my main columns being geography, time, delinquency rate, average mortgage amount, and population size. And then in here, I can see how many of these were reported as being null. Uh, typically, this means that there is an NA uh, or no information in that particular entry. So in here, I have 330 entries, all of which are non-empty. And then for the type, I have object and float and int. Uh, so when I see object around the geography column, this tells me that this is probably encoded as a string. This is also likely encoded as a string. This is encoded as a floating point number and then integers. And then this one is encoded as an integer. So, so far, I have a picture of more or less how much data. So as you can see, it's a fairly small data set. So it won't be it won't be straining our computational resources. And it's also friendly enough in that it's already clean and ready for me to go ahead my visualization. So from here, the first thing I want to take a look at is some of the summary statistics of the numerical columns in the data frame. So the dot describe method will allow us to do that. And so some of the things that I can ask include, okay, so what is the average delinquency rate across all provinces? It would be 44.31%. The 
the average mortgage amount across all provinces is 221,437. And then for the population size, we see we have here something like uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, so about three, three point three point six million. All right. So of course, we're not going to gain insight on the specific provinces and trends by taking taking a look at uh, summary statistics. So this is where we jump in to do a little bit of visualization. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and play with a few commands to get started with some visualizations. And part of the motivation behind doing this is, in this case, the data set is quite small, but of course we don't want to, to focus entirely on a table only. We're going to go ahead and find ways to present that information in a more visual way, in a way that makes it easier for us to pick up trends or outliers. We're gonna go ahead and, and do that. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is remember the, the, the two libraries that we imported was pandas as pd and then plotly.express as px. So this px is going to contain all of the modules associated to plotly.express. In this case, what I'm saying here is I'm saying, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create a scatter plot where the data frame is the data pop del more tf. And I can select the x column or sorry, the X axis and the Y axis by providing the column name. So if I go ahead and execute this, then what I have here is a scatter plot that shows me uh, the trend for each and every one of these provinces. And the first thing you'll notice is there is a lot of missing in this plot. For one, I don't have a title. But two, remember that uh, data pop Delmore DF contains information not just on one province, but on multiple provinces. And to show you this, if I take a look at data pop, uh, okay, and then I we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, province. Uh, let me just go ahead and grab my columns. Actually. Columns. So my columns are geography. So if I go ahead and take a look at geography, and I do dot unique. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different provinces. And so when I go ahead and do px scatter of this particular uh, data frame, without passing, with, with only passing x and y, but no any other parameters, then Plotly is going to generate a scatter plot of all those data points. But at this point, it's very difficult for me to to separate which one is which. So I'm going to go ahead and add one more dimension. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a color. So in this case, notice that each and every one of the variables I'm passing are directly tied to one of the column names. This is important because if I were to say, let's say that instead of doing province, I do, sorry, instead of doing geography, I do province, I'm going to get an error message and let me just exit this. The error message says value of color is not in the name of any of the columns of the data frame. So Plotly is quite smart in that it can detect uh, automatically what values you refer to by simply passing the name of the column. I'm going to go ahead and switch this to geography instead, and I'm going to add a title. All right, and the original plot we have is scatter. Okay, so now I have here a plot that contains the same, the same dots that you saw before. This is the exact same plot, but now I've added one more dimension in which I am now coloring by uh, the geography. Furthermore, uh, there is an interactive element to this. If I wanted to take a look at the trend for Ontario, for example, I can double click at Ontario and I can now see that over time, it looks like the delinquency rate within Ontario decreased. And I can isolate different provinces if I wanna compare them to give them at a time and so on. Uh, other things that I can do is I can export these as a PNG. Uh, once you export a plot to a PNG file, you will lose that interactive component. But you can also this and save this into. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do fake. I can believe the command is fake. Save HTML. And then you can see. HTML. So if I go ahead and run this, uh, I think it's two HTML. No, that is not what I want to do. 
I cannot remember to the top of my head what the command is. I'll look it up in a, in a bit. But the idea is I can save uh, plots into HTML. And by doing so, I can save, um, I can preserve the interactiveness. All right. OK, so uh, let's take a look at things like average mortgage amount and population size. So we can go ahead and uh, generate different types of visualizations by changing the different, uh, the different y variables. So before I had my average mortgage amount, I can go ahead and grab this. I can also take a look at the delinquency rate and then the population size. So notice that Plotly will be fairly smart in terms of identifying uh, quickly which set of data we want to visualize by simply changing the variable. So from here, we're moving from a single line of code to sort of trying to find ways to generalize this. Uh, the reason for this is because we want to be able to turn this into a function. When we build the Dash app, we will rely heavily on functions. So the sooner we package or we think about ways to put this into a function that I can reuse, the easier it's going to be for me to go from an exploratory visualization code to a dashboard app. OK, so other things that we can take a look at include uh, other types of visualizations include the box plot, which not only show us a trend uh, over time, but also can show us whether there is a statistically significant difference between the means of um, uh, the different provinces. In this case, I picked the delinquency rate by geography. So in this case, I can see that it looks like New Brunswick seems to have a higher average compared that on delinquency rate compared to all the other provinces. And so as before, I can do this this again, where I can go ahead and set a variable. And then I can pick my geography to be sort of how I want to break down uh, the different groups. And then I can change the variable. So before, so the one before I had was um, delinquency rate. If I switch that to average mortgage amount, I can now see that British Columbia has, on average, the highest average mortgage amount, and so on. So again, we're, we're trying to think this in terms of moving from, from a single line of code into something that we can later on generalize. All right, so the last plot I'm going to go ahead and show you is just a, a scatter plot. So we saw this before where our x axis was the time, but this time I'm setting my x axis to be at delinquency rates. And in this case, I don't want to watch the trend over time, but rather I want to see whether there's a relationship or some kind of correlation between two different variables. Uh, similarly, I could go ahead and pick something like population size and take a look at whether there's a trend. And again, the problem here is once more, we're breaking things down by province, and I don't really know which one is which. So I'm going to go ahead and add the color parameter. So once I add the color parameter, I can now see which provinces are which. So if I wanted to take a look at whether there's a trend or a relationship between the delinquency rate and the average mortgage amount for British Columbia, kind of looks it looks like it's not quite but it looks like there might be a bit of a negative relation going on and you notice thing I added one more thing a hover name population size so if I wanted to add an additional dimension I can now add okay so what was the population during uh, during this particular time period uh, another parameter that you can add if you want to preserve even more dimensions within within the visualization is to add hover data so hover data is going to contain a dictionary where I can pass, for instance, let's just say um, time, and I can pass the true key. So when I pass the true key, notice that now when I hover over the point, at the very bottom I see time, and then it shows me the quarter. So if I wanted to, I could also pass population name as one of my hover data parameters instead of a hover name. So if I go ahead and pass this, I'm going to set it to false first. So now when I go ahead and hover, I have the geography, the delinquency rate, the average mortgage amount, and the time, but no population size. I can pass this as true. And now I have the population size. So really, the idea behind this is you can use this interactive feature to encapsulate as much information as you want without uh, turning your plot overwhelming. All right. So 
Uh, the next thing I'm going to go ahead and share with you is a trick for using dictionaries to access different kinds of functions. So if you have worked with dictionaries before, it has the exact same format as I showed you here, where I have a set of keys. Uh, and then on the left hand side, colon separated by a, a set of uh, values. The values can be either a string, an integer, a Boolean, a list, or another data structure. And so this is the format of a dictionary. But some of these values can also be functions themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So for example, uh, if I do a sample dictionary right here, sample dictionary. So this contains the following data structure. The way I access the values in a dictionary is by its numbers, is by passing the key name. And then that is going to provide the access to that particular particular set of values. Now notice in this case, uh, all of these are data structures. I have a list, I have a set, I have a tuple, and in here I have a function. So this function is the sum function that takes this input an iterable and a start. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because uh, during our exploration of visualizations, you might have noticed that I did px.scatter, the data frame, the x value, the y value, and so on. But then when I switched to the box plot, all I had to do was go from px.scatter to px.box. So I'm going to go ahead and use a dictionary to make it easier for me to generalize accessing um, different values. So if I want to use the sum function, for instance, I can say sum, and then I can pass a list of numbers that I want to add up. In this case, if I add up the numbers 1, 2, 3, then the result is 6. This is equivalent to 1 plus 2 plus 3. OK, so then uh, if I wanted to go ahead and use the sum function, so remember before we did sum of 1, 2, 3, if we were to use our dictionary to sum these values, these two are equivalent. And now, from a notation point of view, this looks very complicated and convoluted. Uh, this is much easier to read, uh, but I'll, 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 we'll see in a moment where and what scenario this type of um, uh, accessing dictionaries will come in handy. All right, we can. the idea behind it is that we can use the dictionary to, to generate different kinds of plots, where the different kinds of plots are either a box plot, a scatter plot, or a line plot. So I can set up a dictionary where the keys are going to be the different types of values. And then the values, sorry, yeah, sorry, the different kinds of plots. I'm just using the keyword box or violin or scatter or line. I can change the name of the keys if I want to. I'm going to keep them lowercase for now. And then the functions can be um, px.box, px.violin, px.scatter. So notice when I do plot dictionary and I pass the keyword box. I now have access to this plotly function, which means if I do, uh, I can do data pop the mark x, I'm going to do uh, geography, and then y, I am going to do uh, delinquency rate. And I go ahead and do this, I now have a box plot. Now, if I wanted to take a look at this as a scatter, all I have to do is change the keyword to scatter. And of course, this is not a plot that makes sense. But the key thing here is we're not going to go ahead and start playing with this notion of changing variables to generate a, a, a wide number of different plots. We can switch this to line now. And so notice that the key here is I'm only making uh, modifications in at the variable, at these variables, so that I don't have to rewrite the function over and over again. OK. So let's go ahead and write it uh, out a little bit more um, structured. I typically like, like adding line breaks. It makes it easier for me to read and parse my, my function. So as before, I can switch this to the box one. And so if at some point I want to go from taking a look at the delinquency rate and instead taking a look at the average mortgage amount, I just have to change the variables, and all of a sudden, I have a plot. 
So you can start to see that the main players in the function are going to be the x value, which is this right here, the y value, and then the plot kind. So now we can start thinking of ways we can start packaging our function. So let's just say I'm going to go ahead and take this right here. I'm going to take this right here. And I'm going to go ahead and take this right here. So now I can say plot time. This is going to be x value. This is going to be y value. Which means all I have to do now is change the values of x, y, and plot. And I can now generate quite a few different kinds of plots. All right. So I'm just going to skip this. And I'm going to go ahead and jump into how we can go from exploratory code onto a function. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the next piece. I'm going to exit the presentation mode since the function is a lot larger. I'm going to show it to you in full. So in here, you can start picking up on the different components that are part of our function. So you've seen this before. This is a plot dictionary that contains the keywords to the different functions. And then this is the line of code that says, OK, so access the different. So this is going to be a dictionary. And then here I'm going to take a simple one of the key names. And then afterwards, I just plot uh, the data frame. In this case, I'm passing it uh, as region DF, dimension 1, dimension 2, or x value and y value. I'm going to go ahead and color by geography, and then I'm adding a hover name as time. And then from there, some of the things that I am no, doing. Can you, yep. can you zoom in just a bit on this one? It's just a little small. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So this means you're going to lose, lose seeing the whole function, but I'll break it down. So as before, whenever we go from, from loose code, as we saw here, onto a function, some of the things that I really want to make sure that I document include the parameters and then what it returns. So in this case, uh, in this case, I have my parameters region df, which is I'm encoding as a data frame object. It tells me what exactly I expect to, to receive. Um, the graph type, which is a string, can be either one of box, violin, scatter, or line. Dimension one, which is going to be of string type, and it can be either one of time or geography. And then dimension two, can be either one of average mortgage amount, this should have been delinquency rate, delinquency rate or population size, and then returns a plotly figure. So other things that I'm adding here include a try and accept. And the reason for this is because I want to make my function a little bit more robust in case I make a mistake when I am using it. So for example, uh, if I raise the key error message, this means that I potentially entered, this is meant to capture when I've entered the wrong key. So for example, if I enter box with a capital B, instead of everything breaking, it's just going to return an error message at me. And I'm going to use this error message when I'm debugging and troubleshooting things in my Dash app. So let's go ahead and try this out. Um, so if I go ahead and try now graph region is the name of my function. And then I pass data pop Delmore df box geography and delinquency rate, that is going to generate a box plot that contains geography and delinquency rate by geography. If I go ahead and do a box plot again, but this time a population size, all I have to do is uh, switch delinquency rate to population size, and I now have this box plot showing me the population size. And then if I want to take a look at a relationship between two variables, say average mortgage amount and delinquency rate, all I have to do is, okay, so say graph region, my data frame, the type of plot, and then the relationship between the two. Now, uh, where things might go wrong, and this is where I added my try except, is let's say that I do box with a capital E instead of lowercase b. I now have a message that says key not found. Make sure that graph type is in one of these. So again, this was something that I, I printed. I wanted to make sure that I remind myself if I'm ever making a mistake. And that is because once we're moving from function to dash app, we want to have some kind of mechanism to capture things without breaking the code. Uh, once the code breaks within the dash app, then then, um, then the, the instance shuts down and I can't go back unless I fix what's going wrong. 
OK, so I'm going to go ahead and jump from uh, the function onto scripting, because now, now that we've gone from exploratory code to a function that we can go ahead and reuse, uh, we can now put this function inside a Python script. So this Python script is what's going to make it possible for me to, to generate uh, my Dash app. So I'm going to jump into part two, dashboard components. So the first part we did uh, data exploration. Uh, what we did is we used the pandas and plotly libraries to get familiar. And then from there, we, we went ahead and visualized uh, with uh, uh, visualized different kinds of plots. We saw the box plot, the scatter plot, and the line plot. And furthermore, we uh, generalized our code into a reusable function. So now we get to talk about uh, the dashboard components. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So some of the things that are going to be important for a dashboard include the py script. Uh, typically, we call it app.py the requirements.txt file. And then this is just for, for making sure that you are easing the process of deploying online as much as possible. So this requirements.txt file is this file we saw here before, where we essentially encapsulate the libraries and then any versions that we use. The proc file and git ignore, these two are more related to deploying, whether Heroku or any other online service. Typically, the git ignore is part of a lot of Python packages or R packages. And it essentially tells GitHub and Git, um, if I'm going to go ahead and be working with a bunch of different files, I want to make sure that all of these are not pushed. And these are typically very useful because uh, part of having a requirements.txt file is so that we can have an environment activated. Uh, so generating virtual environments oftentimes takes up a bunch of files and, and space, and we don't want to clutter our GitHub repository or our app with the environment files themselves. So we just go ahead and add um, environment dependencies or environment uh, folders to the Git ignore. And then the last thing we give is a prop file. So this is just going to go ahead and tell um, uh, the, the Git repository that this should be treated as an app. So all we have to do is web g unicorn app server. All right, so uh, a little bit about the script anatomy. So we you, we have seen, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit. There we go. We're actually probably better so I can preserve the zooming in. So you've seen this notation a little bit before when you saw me uh, write this as a function, where I have def, the name of the function, the parameters. I have a little doc string that tells me what they take as input, and I have the body of the function afterwards. So we can generalize functions this way for not just visualizing, but it's usually really good practice to package them as such. You can even add a hint for the type of parameter you expect um, by adding the variable name, colon, and then specifying the type. This is called type casting. All right, so uh, if I go ahead, if I wanted to go ahead and package uh, my function graph region onto a script, then we can go ahead and put it into a py file as follows. So if I were to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and exit this again, because this is looking quite ugly, but I have my function here. The only thing that's going to be new is I'm going to add my two libraries or any library that I'm using. In this case, all I rely on is pandas and plotly.express. And then the new thing you'll notice here is I'm adding an executable piece. So if name equals main, so what this is doing, it's in case of anything underneath this, you're going to treat as an executable, meaning if I were to run this from the terminal or from any Python interpreter, then it can go ahead and say, oh, okay, so you want me to create a variable called URL, read it into a data frame object, display the first few entries, and then generate a few graphs. So this means if I go ahead and uh, run this, and I can run this from, um, if I'm on Jupyter, I can run the whole script as is right now. But also, if I save the content of this script onto a file called basescript.py, which is what I have right here, uh, basescript.py has the imports 
the graph region function, which we, 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 we work towards getting together, and then the main program. So once I save this as base script.py, I can now execute this. And I can execute this both from a terminal, but also I can execute it from a Jupyter notebook. Um, so this is kind of a nice trick I like using whenever I want to, I have a lot of different visualizations or different things that I want to do. And if I want to avoid having big, big clunks or big chunks of scripts in the Jupyter Notebook, I just package it into a nice script. Now, one of the limitations of this approach is, of course, um, uh, if I wanted to execute a script either in Jupyter Notebook or in the terminal, and I'll go ahead and let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. I'm afraid this is going to be too small. Is it too small, Reshima? It's a little bit smaller. If you could zoom in a little bit. More. OK. Let's see if I can do properties. I don't know if Command Plus just how, oh, you don't have, you have a Windows machine. Uh -huh. Let me do font. Let me do 36. That's probably a little bit bigger. Is that better? Yep, that's better. OK. So let me just go ahead and change. Word. Okay, so this dashboard workshop dash contains the exact same thing as the repository. And so in there, if it once if you want to follow this on your own, one of the things that that is required or that is outlined as part of the prep step is to set up a virtual environment. Again, this virtual environment is going to allow us to run the scripts with the same versions as what's outlined on the requirements.txt file. So if I go ahead and do, in my case, I called it uh, env2, env2 scripts and activate. You'll notice that right now I am on base. So right now all the versions that I have on base are not necessarily the same as I have on my activated environment. On env2, what I'm doing is I am enforcing the requirements.txt by running the command pip install r. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I want to do. Requirements.txt um, install. OK, so this, uh, this requirements.txt essentially allow us to say, OK, so I want to have an environment that contains only those libraries that I specify in requirements.txt. In this case, I've already done the installation, so it's just going to go ahead and use the cached versions. But if you notice the versions in here, and it's probably too, too fast, it's just moving through all of the requirements that I specified right here. It's saying, OK, so let's go ahead and install Dash. Let's go ahead and install Dash Core Components version 1.16. And it's doing it for each and every one of these, plus or minus a few, a few extra dependencies. So every time it finds something that, that one of these dependencies um, needs, and hopefully this doesn't break on me. But anyway, that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. So the two ways, just to iterate, the two ways I can run a script is either from a Jupyter Notebook or from the terminal. If I go ahead and execute it from the terminal, yeah, of course it's going to fail. Uh, it's OK. So if I were to execute this from the terminal, I go notebooks, dir, cd, nv scripts. So inside nv scripts, I see that there's app.py and base script py. So this base script py contains, again, the import of pandas and plotly. It also contains the graph region function and then the main program, where I just go ahead and read the data and visualize it. So if I were to execute Python base script py, that is going to go ahead and run the function, and then it generates these three plots. So when I run it from the terminal, it just displays these plots uh, separately. Now, of course, the, the limitation here is, again, I have these plots separately. And, and if I wanted to generate 10 or 20 different kinds of plots, I now have to move through the different windows, and it's overwhelming. and I don't get the bigger picture, and there's no no coherent sense or story. So this is where we move on to the Dash app. Uh, but now we, we have most of the machinery in place. So we have our imports, 
our function in our main program. So now there comes the dash part of the script. So this is the next piece. So uh, the app.py script is very going to be very similar to the base script that I showed you. We're going to have our imports, our function, and a main program. But a few things are going to be incorporated, and the main program is going to change a little bit. So the first thing is going to be different is we're going to want to add our dash imports, any external style sheets. So one thing that's key here to remember is that there is um, a crossover between Python and HTML whenever we're building one of these dash apps. So if you have any familiarity with things like HTML and CSS styling, that is kind of going to come in super, super handy for designing your dashboard how you want it. If you've never done this before, that's OK, as long as you, you feel comfortable with the basics and you, you see each and every one of these plots as a section and you start structuring your code in a way that you understand it's a section, then you'll be fine. So if you have that HTML, CSS, then you have all the freedom to go ahead and style your dashboard as you want. And if you don't, that's OK. The, the bare minimum does allow you to put together uh, well-structured dashboards. We have the app initialization, the layout so again. Yep. yep. Can you zoom in again, please? Uh, yes. Thank better? you. Yeah. No words. And I'll probably go back to the slide mode. That's probably better. All right. So some of our dash imports include uh, dash. And I think this one might have changed since one of the upgrades I did. Uh, but typically, I want to import DCC. So from DCC, I have access to drop down menus. So if I want to switch between different kinds of plots, and I don't want to have to regenerate them on my script each time, I can I can get things like a drop down menu, or check in bottoms or check boxes, sorry, check in buttons or check boxes. Um, and then other things that I'm going to be using are input and output. So this is where the magic of um, updating your functions on the go comes in. And let me, I think I'm just going to go ahead and exit this, the presentation mode. OK, so external sheets. So again, if you have worked with CSS before, then you can use external style sheets. Uh, if you want to have your, your app have specific font or a specific color palette, you are more than welcome to use some of these external style sheets. And then from here, other things that you want to have include initializing the app. Uh, so this typically means using dash dot dash. I pass my external style sheets. And then I initialize the server through app dot server. And now we get to the app layout. So again, if I want to go ahead and, and build a dashboard, you can think of building the dashboard as um, uh, think of it as a blank canvas, a blank square canvas, where you can decide how you're going to divide it. And so maybe what makes more sense, it'll, this will make more, more sense when we start playing with the different kinds of layouts. But think of these as building blocks for your dashboard. Uh, if you've never worked with HTML before, this DIB is, is acting essentially the same as a DIB would in an HTML page. We can see, OK, when I create a new block right here, and you can decide what lives inside that block. So typically, we can put here a drop-down menu or an interactive plot. We can add things like a title or a header or even text. Um, and then the last piece is going to be decorator callbacks. So suppose you want to make it so that you have a user menu. And whenever you, you click on the user menu, you have the option to select a different kind of plot. And then that automatically generates the plot that you selected. So what's going on behind the scenes is you have a function that updates a figure. And the figure can be like what we generated here in our graph region function. And then in here, I have the dec decorator that says, OK, so the output is going to be a figure. And then the input is going to be some kind of parameter. So the parameter can be what the user chose. And so the way Dash connects, what I, how I drop, click on a drop-down menu versus updating the plot is simply by saying, OK, so there's a function that generates a plot. And so uh, the, the what's really, really neat about this is all you need is to take note of um, IDs. And this will probably be kind of become more clear once I show you the full Dash app. But you essentially connect a figure 
in a drop down menu to an ID and then pass those IDs as parameters to make sure that you are updating the right one. So I'm going to go ahead and show you just a quick example of this in action. So in here, let me just zoom out a little bit. In here, I have a script that contains a dash app. So again, this is the same as the base script that we saw before, except with a little bit of extra machinery under the hood. So we have my pandas module, my plotly module, and then I have the new dash um, libraries. I have my external style sheet, my app initialization, my function, and then the main program is going to say app.runserver. So all this is going to do is when we when we run this script from the terminal, instead of it generating the plots and throwing them all over the place, it's going to generate an instance of a Flask app, sorry, Flask app that I can then visit by a single URL. So I'm going to go ahead and do it as a quick demo. So we have our imports. This time we have our graph region function that we played with in the first part of the webinar, where we have a plot that takes a, a simple uh, a pandas data frame, the type of graph, dimension one, dimension two, and as output, it shows uh, a plotly figure. And in this case, this has to be switched not to none, but rather I want to return the figure. So if I go ahead and return the figure, and in this case, this is running, yeah, so when I execute this, it's gonna say dash is running on, it tells me a server name. Now, I don't think this works yet. So this doesn't work if I execute it from a Jupyter notebook. So I'll have to execute this from the terminal. But the idea is the same here. I have the graph region, I read the data, and then I have the app. So let's go ahead and try this out. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this whole thing. And I'm gonna put it onto app.py. Yeah, so this one has a lot more stuff going on. So all this app is going to do is it's going to show me a housing uh, graphs header and it's going to have a drop down menu. So let me go ahead and do Python app.py. So when I run Python app.py, uh, I now have here, right, and I should make sure that I modify the dependencies because that has changed. So if I go ahead and copy this and I visit this on a web browser, I now have the following. So this is housing graphs and it has a drop down menu. The drop down menu isn't doing anything right now. And that's because within my base script, sorry, let me just go open app.py. In the layout, all I'm saying is, okay, I wanna have a header one that says housing apps and I wanna have a drop down menu with the ID province, but I'm not really doing anything to this drop down as I just have it as this. So that's it. So um, if I were to take a look at, let's just make this from header one to header two. Can I save this? I'll go ahead and refresh this. Uh, yeah, okay. You can sometimes take a little bit of time to refresh. Now this should be a little bit smaller. I can switch, switch up um, where this is located and so on. Now, let's say that instead of me just wanting to have a drop down menu, I want to have a drop down menu in a plot that updates automatically. All right. So, um, before I jump into that, I want to share with you a little bit about um, a little bit about why designing your your layout matters. Uh, typically, if you notice here, what's going on is I have my layout as an, a nested uh, nested elements within my HTML div. So you can imagine that the more elements I want to add, the more convoluted this nested uh, series of elements is going to get. So typically before you don't want to use this layout as your, your brainstorming space, because it's very, very easy to introduce bugs. But rather what I suggest to do is to first decide ahead of time what it is that you want to do and then build from there. So in, in my mind, I wanna have a dropdown menu with the X variable, a dropdown menu with the Y variable, and then the plot. So this means, okay, I'm gonna have one, two, three, four divisions. And then each of these divisions is going to be connected to some kind of uh, component within the app. So let's try it out. So for example, in this case, I have the dropdown menu that is specified within the app.layout piece of my app. I have HTML div that contains a header one and a drop down menu. And in this case, 
notice that this one has a different ID. So in this case, I'm saying, okay, so in this case, I want this to be graph type and then contain the labels. So if I go ahead and copy this and bring it onto my app, let's say that I want to, and actually let's not do that. Let's just add it as one more. Let's just add this as one more drop down. So I now have one drop down menu with the province and one drop down menu with the graph type. So if I go ahead and go back to my app, I now see here my two drop, drop down menus, one with the province and one for the type of plot. So notice how thinking about it in terms of blocks first and then and then bringing those onto the division or the diff is, is exactly why we want to first design our outline and then code. Otherwise, if I forget a comma here, notice, let's say I forget a comma, and then I try to update it. Now I have this error message. And troubleshooting this while you're while, while you're you're trying to decide what to do is going to become a nightmare. So we want to be really, really careful with with first deciding, then executing. Okay. So what if, for instance, I wanted to, to use this graph type menu to decide the type of plot? Well, in this case, I can now add a graph. So notice I can go ahead and add a graph within the layout that's called ID graph render. So let's just go ahead and add this to my app.py. So at the end of BCC graph menu, I want to go ahead and add my graph. Now, this graph render ID is not connected to anything right now. So when I go ahead and visit this on the local server, OK, so there's a graph. But right now, notice that there is no change. I just have a graph. And I mean, that's great, but it's not connected to anything right now. So this is where using the, the decorator is going to come in really, really handy because now I have a mechanism that takes as input the type of graph. In this case, I'm going to use this ID graph type. And then as output is going to return a figure. And notice how the IDs match here. The output is connected to the graph via the ID graph render. And the input is connected to the dropdown via the ID graph type. That is really, really important because if you mess up the name of the, the, the ID, either on the dropdown or on the callback, then your app is not going to be able to know, to do the updates. And then uh, one thing I typically like to do is to add a function that just calls my graph region function because uh, this graph region function is quite big. And uh, I mean, you're welcome to add the decorator wherever you want. This is more of a styling thing preference for me, where I typically just go ahead and initialize figure zero as an instance of, of that, that um, graph region function. OK, so let's go ahead and add this. So if I go ahead and grab this app callback at the very bottom of this, I'd say, OK, so here's my layout. I have housing graphs. I have a drop down menu with the province, a drop down menu with the graph type, and then a graph. My output is going to have an ID that is exactly the same as this DCC graph ID, and it's going to return a figure. And then my input is going to have the exact same ID as whatever I wanted to be connected to based on the drop down menu. So in this case, I want it to be connected to graph type. And then the type of value is a value. I have a function called def update figure one, or sorry, update figure zero, uh, that takes this input as selected graph. And then from there, I say, okay, so graph region is gonna take filter df, which contains um, uh, the data pop delmore df data frame, the selected graph, which is what's going to change. And for this iteration, I'm just making the geography and the average mortgage amount fixed as the dimensions. So if I go ahead and save this, and I come back here, I now have, uh, let's see, yeah. So I now have a plot that changes as soon as I modify uh, the drop down menu. So all this is doing is it's saying, okay, so whenever I switch uh, the value, it's going to go back to this, this ID that says, okay, so graph render is a figure. So it's just going to generate this, this uh, 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 graph from the graph region function. And then the input here is from graph type. And my options are going to be box, uh, line, or scatter with a nice label scatter plot, line plot, or box plot. Okay, 
so that we, we start to see the connection between the two. And uh, Resham, I noticed that I'm at the, the one hour mark already. So I'm wondering if we have a few more minutes to, to do just a couple more examples and then close remarks or, or what your advice is. Sure, take your time. Um, if people need to leave, it's okay. It's being recorded. So as long as you have the time, um, feel free to take your time and finish whatever. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's add one more thing. So before before we close this off, um, let's add the two dimensions. So this time, now that I have a, a, a Dash app that changes um, that changes the the type of chart, I now want to add a, the capability to switch the x and y variables. And I want to add a little bit more dimension as well. I want to make sure that I, I have more than one plot. Right now, it's kind of just one, one plot and the three drop-down menus. So I want to add a little bit more complexity to the dashboard app. All right. So now let's take a look at a drop-down that updates two figures. So um, this is where we start to think a little bit more about the, the layout. So I'm going to go ahead and let's see if I have... I don't have it here, but let's suppose that instead of me having one drop down or three drop down menus that switch one figure, let's now make it so that one drop down menu switches two figures. In this case, I'm going to want to have two figures side to side connected by a single drop down. So in this case, notice that I'm adding one level of, of complexity and that before I had a single diff and inside that, that diff, I had three components. Uh, a header, a drop down, and a graph. Now I'm going to have um, two main divs with some nested divs inside it. So, again, this is where designing your layout before comes in really, really handy because troubleshooting this gets um, quite, quite finicky. So, the, the, the parent div contains two main divs. Uh, in this case, I want to have my drop down menu at the top and then my two my two plots side to side. And so inside this div, I have uh, two graphs, each of them with the class name six columns. So this is going to help me put them side to side. And then notice that this main div right here has the class name row. So again, if you have some familiarity with HTML, then you might recognize this class name uh, six columns or row, which essentially is going to allow you to play a little bit more with, with your layout, uh, you have things like flex as well, if you if you want to enforce things being side to side or in a specific order. But the idea is, and maybe it makes more sense if I have something like paint. So the idea is I have my, my app layout. So you can think of this main div as my, my whole app. So there's my first div. And then inside that first div, I have here another div that contains a drop down menu. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a text box. Where's the text box? Text box. So this one right here is parent div, which corresponds to this div right here. And then this div right here corresponds to, so I have two, 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 these, these two right here are on the same level. So then I have these two right here. So this first one corresponds to, this one contains H1 and then contains the dropdown. And then these two notice how I'm putting them on the same level. Typically I just use tabbing to sort of help me identify how they are structured. And then this div right here, which is this bigger box contains two more divs with the class name six columns. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, so inside this big div, I wanna have two more so that it looks as follows. So this one contains right here, uh, the graph time mortgage. And then this one right here contains uh, graph time delinquency. Okay, and then this box inside the two, so this corresponds to this div right here. This one has uh, this one has class name row. So this class name row is going to enforce that these two are put next, treated as a as a row next to each other. And then to make sure that they fit, I'm gonna add a class name six column to each of these. 
you can and this is what this is going to do is it's going to make it so that they they are wide enough that they 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 both are readable but not so wide that they push each other outside they fit next to each other if that's name six rows all right so this is sort of my my end result and so what I'm doing is right now is just trying to help you understand sort of how this is structured and where, 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 why we're doing all these nesting things is so that we, we're sort of enforcing this structure that we want via the use of these nested divs. All right. So let me just go ahead and grab uh, the layout. And then you'll notice I now have one more update figure two option. So you'll, you'll, you'll start to see why I like having these sub functions that all they do is update the figure because in this case I can pretty much uh, continue to make my app callback as flexible as I want. The original function takes four different parameters as input, but if I just want to change one or two at a time, I have this flexibility by selecting the callback. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this and just bring it onto my layout. So notice I have my diffs. And again, this is not set in stone. Typically, I just like using tabbing to help me see how they are structured. And then for the callbacks, notice how, again, the ID is going to be what's really key in here. So in this case, um, this update figure one is connected to the graph time mortgage uh, graph. And then it takes us input the province. So in this case, all I am changing here is what province I selected. And then this, this second figure, what this one is doing is this one is updating. Um, let's see, this one is also updating the province. But this one is I didn't, this one is changing the delinquency rate instead. So if I go ahead and take a look at my app, I now see that things are a little bit different. Uh, so this case, what this this layout allows me to do is it allows me to to generate a line chart by province. Okay, so that's all really good. Now, the last thing I want to do before closing things off is um, I'm going to go ahead and ha add my several drop down menus updating the same figure. So as before, notice notice how convoluted they start getting. So this is having an idea in our mind of what we want to do. This was going to come in really, really handy. So first, we want to go ahead and add a drop-down menu for the geography, a drop-down menu for the population size. So that's the parent. That's one div. And then the other thing that we want to do is we're going to add a checklist, and then just show one graph. Uh, so and notice here that I added a couple more things. I'm adding a text style and a card style. Uh, so this is just to make it centered. So in this case, a text style is going to bring our text back to center. So you can play as much as you want with the different layouts. Um, and so typically what I'll do is I'll just spend a bunch of time designing exactly what it is that I want the app to do, and then I go into it. We're just going to take a little bit of time to update, and there we go. So now in this case, I have two drop-down menus. Uh, the first one shows me, yeah, so this one is not going to make a lot of sense. There we go. So the, the first drop-down menu tells me, OK, so what do you want your x value to be? The y-axis is going to be what do you want your y-axis to be, and then I can have a, a checkbox. All I did for the checkbox here was to do a DCC checklist. So you have the two options. You don't necessarily just have to stick down with drop downs. You can also do a checklist. And then now I can decide, okay, so maybe I don't want this to be a scatter plot. I want it to be a line plot instead. And so this now really does give you that, that possibility to really play with different kinds of visualizations all self-contained in one area. And notice in here, whenever there's an error message, in this case, this error message comes from uh, the case where there is nothing selected. Typically, it's a good idea not to ignore these error messages. Um, these are error messages that are not necessarily breaking the, the app. You notice that the app is still running. But what they're doing is they're introducing some kind of bug to the visualization themselves. So um, it's usually a good idea not to ignore this. Uh, in this case, I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a try except uh, clause for catching when no parameter is passed. So that is triggered whenever there's uh, nothing in there. Um, let me see if I have anything else uh, that before before I close any remarks. 
think that might be it. I think this might be it for, for the piece. Okay, so let me just go ahead and, um, yeah, so let me just go ahead. Ah, the last one. So if I want to have multiple, if I want to have multiple ones. So notice how big they start to get. Uh, so the last piece was more about how we can incorporate more and more graphs by using, uh, by using some of these nested dips. But as you can tell, it's getting kind of difficult to read. But the principle is exactly the same. I go ahead and decide what is it that I want my app to do. And I, I, I design and I draw which how many divisions I want. And then I sort of hard code them and debug until I'm happy. Um, yeah, so you can pretty much say, OK, so you want two plots, three plots, four plots, so one. The, the base machinery is there. So the last piece before I finish off is, and this is more optional, we won't have time to go too much into depth, is now that you have uh, a local dashboard. Once you have a local dashboard, that you want to take a look at um, locally. Obviously, the only way to execute this is by uh, cloning the repository and then activating the environment and then running by Python app.py. But obviously, if you want to have this on your website, you wouldn't ask people to go and do that on their own. You want to have it on some kind of uh, uh, web page. And so one of the, I think that one of the, Beginner friendly options is to try it through Heroku, uh, which it's going to act very much as a Git repository. So you can go ahead and do things like clone the repository to your local computer. Uh, you can you can play with the app.py file name until you're happy with the layout. Um, and then, I mean, at least if you're doing it from this way, if you're doing it, if you're doing doing your local develop development for the first time and you want to have this hosted somewhere. Then the first step you want to do is to host this on some on some kind of GitHub repository. In this case, I have it hosted in this uh, in this dashboard prep repository. Um, and then where the Heroku piece comes in is you'd have to create a Heroku account. Uh, you can you can uh, uh, run Git Remote B to confirm that you're good. You add your files and then you get push origin to Heroku. So typically, whenever we're pushing to our main repository we are pushing onto the main branch or whichever branch we're working on. So we can connect Heroku as a Git repository in a very, very similar way, and then pushing all of our files onto that Git repository. So this is where the, the requirements.txt, the proc file, and the Git ignore come in, because by the time you have developed something, and you have an environment in the requirements.txt, you're going to want to have Heroku to have access to the git ignore, which essentially says, okay, so please, whenever I'm pushing things, make sure that you you push, uh, you don't, don't push things that won't be part of the app necessarily. All I need is my py file, my proc file, and my requirements.txt file, and then the app.py file as well. So the idea is you push all of those onto uh, an initialized Git uh, repository for Heroku. And then you can go ahead and visit that page um, to get it to, to be hosted online. Uh, unfortunately, because that is outside of scope of this workshop and I'm already kind of outside uh, the time, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But to re recap and reiterate what we did together today. So we started off with some uh, exploratory code, remember, our very, very first step was to pick a data set and get familiar with the content of the table. Uh, one of the things that you noticed is that the table was very nice and clean. That is very much intentional. And whenever you are developing a dashboard, you want to make sure that you've already done all your due diligence, you've cleaned up your data set, and the data set is ready to be uh, processed and visualized. Uh, we we never start off visualizing something that's that's uh, missing or incomplete or has a lot of inconsistencies because that's going to bring a lot of unforeseen errors onto our visualization so the very very first step is we want to make sure that the data set is clean and ready to be visualized this step can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks to a few months depending on how how severe the data cleaning situation is um, but once we're at that stage, we can then go ahead and do visualization. So the first thing you saw me do, do uh, you saw me do a few, a few uh, quick visualizations through the, 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 Plotly, the Plotly library scatter and the box functions. You saw me 
increase the amount of complexity or detail to these visualizations via me passing things like a color or a title parameters. And then the next thing you saw me do was you saw me package this code onto a function that I can reuse. So uh, you saw me package it. Let me just scroll down to the very function. So you saw me package it into this function where I've added a doc string. And if you try accept clauses to make it easy for me to debug. And then the next step for me was to bring this function onto a script. Now, you don't have to move on to base script like I did here. This was more of an intermediate step to make it easier connecting a, a Python script to a Dash app. But ideally, once you have your function, you can bring it on directly to your Dash app where you have your imports, your function. And then the only things that are really different between any regular executable Python script and your Dash app is uh, a little bit the structure of the app and also how the app has things like the sheets, uh, the style sheets, sorry, the initialization of the Dash app and server, the style, and the layout. Some of my takeaway home lessons for this is always, always spend some time deciding how you want your app to look like before you program. Because as you can see here, nesting divs inside divs can get quite hairy and troubleshooting and cleaning this up uh, it can get quite complicated if you're sort of brainstorming at the same time you are developing. So just to make things a lot cleaner, always decide what you want and then go ahead and program it. And then the last thing is uh, to preserve or to, to generate this sort of interactive plot where you have some kind of drop down menu that changes the kind of plot that you want to show. The key player here is the use of the decorators. And within the decorators, uh, the use of these ID connecting the, either the dropdown or your graph. So I would say this is it in terms of summarizing what the webinar covered. So I'll leave it at that. I'll stop the share for now. And then if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to, to contact me. I'll just type my Twitter handle. You're also more than welcome to contact me on GitHub. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess GitHub, you can, you can send me an issue or something, but no, let me just go ahead and send my LinkedIn. So you're also more than welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. And I see there were a few questions I missed uh, on the chat. Oh, thank you all for your comments. Uh, so let's see. So with Plotly, you have JavaScript to interpret the data in the browser, and with Python, you embed the HTML code. So you can think of Plotly, the Python package, as a wrapper for for Plotly, Plotly, the JavaScript uh, framework. Uh, so. This Plotly library is not just associated to Python. There's there's wrappers for R, there's wrappers for Python, and in the back of the scenes, it's all JavaScript based. So this is why you're getting things like the, um, the interactive menus and the interactive plots is because behind the hood, it's all JavaScript. So the, the Python wrapper that I shared with you today allows you to essentially preserve you staying in the same Python language without having to switch between different frameworks. So. I guess maybe that's why they're doing this HTML, uh, the DCC.html, uh, so that you still have some kind of similarity between the two languages. But the idea is you don't have to switch frameworks to have uh, a Python script that does your data processing and then a JavaScript that does your data visualization. So what Plotly is doing is it's giving you a wrapper to keep it all self-contained under the same language. Um, Flask, so it's a framework that also allows you to generate Python apps. Uh, it's very similar in that you can you can generate a .py script, and then you just run it on the terminal, and that's going to initialize a local server that contains whatever you want your your Python script to do. But then the nice thing is it just, it's just not contained to a Python script. You can then launch it as a as a website. Um, so and, there's a couple yeah. of questions in the Q and A tab, and the first one is. How can we use this Python Plotly dashboard on the websites we develop that we use a certain data set? So I guess it's probably embedded within a certain website. Yeah. Um, I don't, I haven't had the exposure to hosting it 
on a website outside Heroku. So my go-to, at least how I understand how Heroku is set up, is you can, it's, that one is initialized as a Git repository, um, but I haven't had any experience as of today in terms of hosting it outside Heroku and onto any other website. What I do know is that some of the key player files are your requirements file, your proc file, and then your Git ignore. Um, but yeah, I don't have knowledge at this stage for how to embed it onto, onto websites in general. So the next question is, I have seen server related info in the blue quote blue section on the dashboard screen, but wasn't able to make sense of it. Could you please briefly introduce that section and how we can use it to make our dashboards better? Uh, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, Something about seen... the blue section of the dashboard screen. Blue section. Oh, I think I know what you mean. I think you mean. I think you mean this, right? This, uh, I mean, this is the only blue piece I see. I mean, I think this piece, uh, if, if, if you mean this, if you click on it, you can see whether the server is available. So in this case, if I go back in here, so my dash is running on this local server. So if I go ahead and kill it, I'm just gonna go ahead and press control C. So now it's it's dead. Uh, if I go ahead and refresh this, of course, the server. Yeah, so now it says server not available. So um, you can sort of use this to help you troubleshoot. Uh, let me just go back here. Run it again. Now it's running again. So if you, if that's what you mean by the blue piece, like it, it shows you whether you have callbacks or errors. In this case, yeah. So notice, for instance, in this case, this is telling you uh, this is telling you all your different callbacks. In this case, not, remember for this one, I have a, uh, a drop-down menu that picks the x-axis, a drop-down menu that picks the y-axis, uh, check marks that pick the type of column, that's graph type, and then that uh, returns a figure. So this callback shows you this diagram for how your app is working. Uh, you can take a look at it from, from, from top to right as well. one. So in this case, I have three different kinds of outputs, sorry, inputs and one output. If I have a, a mistake, uh, so let me just go ahead and close the callbacks. Remember, one of the errors comes whenever I, I, I don't have anything selected. That's one of the callback errors. So if I go ahead and take a look at toggle errors, uh, essentially, if you want to ignore it, you're like, yeah, I don't care about that error, then, then you can just toggle it and then it won't come up. But if you want to take a look at what exactly is going wrong, you can use this information to help you troubleshoot. Like in this case, I have a list index out of range. And that is because uh, for the selected graph, I am assuming it's a list and that it always has an element inside it. But if I don't select anything, then list index out of range makes sense because it's I'm passing an empty list as input. So that's bad programming design on my part or selecting, uh, selecting a checkbox. A drop-down menu would be the most sensible if I'm gonna go ahead and assume there's always something there. So that's sort of what the blue the blue piece comes in, if, if I understand this as the blue part of the Dash app. So yeah, I think that is a question that the person had. Um, the next question is, I do see some byte transferred info and how different sections sections of the callbacks are connected. Is it something you consider, especially while dealing with a large data set? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, it was all very fast because the data set is tiny. I have had experience working with huge data sets that essentially render the dashboard uh, useless because of how long it takes for the functions to update the data. So having that kind of how fast the dashboard operates is really, really useful for when you're dealing with, with huge data sets. When you're picking up on the dashboard, taking you can set it as a threshold. If, you're, if your dashboard is taking longer or taking more resources than you would like, uh, you need to start incorporating things like uh, cached data sets uh, and caching within your functions to make sure that you keep your run, your run time down. Um, yeah, but it's mostly to preserve that functionality and keep your dashboard up and running. I, I had one instance when the data set was, I think something like two, five gigabytes or something. And then one of the functions was slicing 
and subsetting the data frame and doing processing at the same time as visualizing, which is a no-no. You always want to keep them separate. And so every time I did a drop-down update, it had to go through the computations. And it was so it was so slow, it almost looked like there was nothing going on. It was just taking a really, really long time. But uh, you can use that information to help you assess whether you have some um, inefficient functions running in the background and, and help you assess what you need to do about those. There's another question. What is the maximum size of the data sets that you would use? Uh, so, I mean, I don't think that, I, th I don't think there's a max, I think in terms of what, what data you would use, I think once you start noticing that the data frame or the, the dash is starting to lag, I start looking at the file format that I'm reading and I start looking at caching. So one, for instance, one really good thing to do when you're dealing with a large data set is read we save and read them as pickle files instead of as CSV or Excel files, which oftentimes can be quite memory consuming. Other things that I would take a look into doing are um, incorporating caching. Uh, and I can, let me see if I can find a good uh, cache, caching. I think there is, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and share this particular blog on performance can do there's a few tricks you can do for you know just have it on the chat okay there's a few tricks you can do to keep your performance up and running without making it uh tight necessarily to to the data set um one again i'll just write it down choose pickle files instead of excel or csv that's another option and then looking into caching so that you're not you, you're not stuck rereading or reprocessing the data from scratch. So um, I'm going to um, I wanted to ask you, Laura. Um, there is the enterprise level plotly as well. I'm wondering if that offers features for people who are doing oh. things for work at, at an enterprise level with you know, real-time data, very large data sets. I, have, I haven't personally used the enterprise level, but maybe that's, that's an option. That's that's probably an option. I haven't used it uh, personally myself, but I, I do know that they have more customization and functionality in place. So if you are dealing with something that's huge or real-time, I would definitely consider looking into the enterprise and see what their packages and options are. Um, okay. So with that, um, we are going to end the webinar. Thank you so much um, for, for, uh, for doing this presentation on a Saturday. Um, it looks like it's very well received. I have personally watched it and followed your tutorial and I was able to, I've done probably graphs, I just didn't know how to do a dashboard and I was able to create a dashboard. Um, so thank you so much. And the recording for this will be available um, in a day or so. And the GitHub is on the Meetup event. Uh, we've shared it a number of times. The repo is, um, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's, it's on the Meetup event. And we'll put it in the video description um, once the video is posted. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rashama, for having us and for hosting on a Saturday as well.